sunrise service. Have you ever been to one of those? Joe and I were talking a little bit about that today. We used to have those back in the day, I guess. You know, we could still have pulled that off. We have a lakeside <laughs> sunrise service. But it's exciting. Um, everybody here, whether you're used to being in a church gathering on Easter Sunday or not, you have Easter memories. You do. We all do. And as I shared with you earlier, I'm going to share a little picture later about that. But we're going to share the word today. Um, I don't know how long it's been for some of you since you, you read the Gospels and you read the four different accounts of this day, of the Easter Sunday. We hear a lot about the crucifixion and we see a lot about it on TV. But I wonder how long it's been since some of us have, have read it. And today, as I read through it myself a few weeks ago for this, thinking of this day, I thought about the, the honor and the privilege that I have to, to offer this day. Because I spent a lot more days sitting where you are looking at somebody else than I have <coughs> from here. And I don't take that lightly. And another thing that I I, uh, I won't take lightly, I, I never have, and I've, as you, many of you know, I've recently been where you are, is that this many people and, and thousands, hundreds of thousands all over the world have given their time to a message about Easter, a spiritual message that they want in their life or at least that they're open enough to that they allow somebody to drag them to church. <coughs> and it really made me sad. I would say in the last two or three months, it made me sad. And almost to the point of angry. That that many people were giving their time. That many people were willing to say, I want to listen to something. And I didn't really know if they were being fed. I was there and I didn't feel like I was. And I don't take this responsibility lightly at all. So, we've all heard that churches can be about confession, right? Confession is good for the soul. Those of you that were here last week realized that I started, uh, we were talking about preparation for today with Jack for telling us to how he prepares for church, which he failed to do. <laughs> so I'm giving him another chance this week, and we're going to start with confession. Jack, you need to go first. <laughs> and the camera's right there. You can just look into it. <laughs> no, I, you know I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. But seriously, the reason that I wanted to talk about that, seriously, is because I think churches have done a darn good job at making people feel that way. <clears throat> at making people feel like they're under the gun or that they shouldn't be there or that there's a problem with them and I can't go there. And you know what? If you look at Jesus' life, which is all that we need to do, sure, he had his group around him that he was teaching and preaching to, but Jesus went and hung out with the other people that the religious institution couldn't understand. The people that had real problems, everyday problems. And that's what I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of something that realizes that people need to find that Savior. Because I know that they have a reason and they have a want in their hearts. And I'm just grateful that I get a little bit of a chance to be a part of that. We want to be able to offer a different way than it's sometimes offered. So, Easter morning, we've already discussed this. And this picture that I'm going to put up, I hope it's fuzzy. You'll see why. This is what Easter used to be to me. Oh, that's the title. <laughs> They're all good at this, buddy. <laughs> I'm going to stand back so you can all see that. That is me in 1987. 
That is me in 1987, the year that I graduated high school. I will call your attention to a few things, because if I don't, my family will. Notice the longer hair blowing in the wind in the back? Yeah, maybe that was what you had in the 80s. It was longer back then, right? Yeah. And also, notice this is for my kids. That is the car that I drove. So get real about the ones you have to drive and you want to complain about. Them. That's my 73 Torino, baby, and it was okay. It was not wax that some of the red would come off, but it was okay. But do you know why I share that? Because I've come from there to here. I was not a believer there. That was Easter morning. That was in Julie's front yard. That's her mailbox kind of behind me. You can kind of see it in another picture. Okay? I had to zoom in on it a little bit. Because I didn't believe then that I went to church. The only reason I went to church is because Julie went to church. If I wanted to be with her on Easter morning, I had to go to church. But I go to church. I, I get a decent shirt out, put on some dress pants. It'll work. I drove over, stopped in front of the driveway. Well, you can't tell me that there. <laughs> to go out and go in and get her so we could go to church. I wasn't a believer. I was a pretty decent guy, I guess. I didn't, you know, lie, cheat, or steal. I may have said a foul word. But that was it. I was a pretty decent guy. But I wasn't a believer. That was me. That was me in 1987. I was one of those people that was sitting there looking to see if what the people that gathered in the church and called themselves a believer of a certain way of thinking, if they were any different than the guy on the street. That was what I, that's what I was doing when I left there. Besides trying to hold her hand. That was it. That was me. And I think that there are some here that are in that same spot. You may be older, you may be younger. But you're in that same spot. So then fast forward a few years from there. I don't have any of those pictures. I look like me now. I was sitting in a church. I was a believer. I was something in a church. I can't even tell you at that point in time. And I decided as I sat there before service to just read the Gospels. Imagine that. I was going to read my Bible in church. <laughs> How crazy was I? I was a rebel. And as I was reading my Bible in church, I was reading the account on an Easter Sunday. That's why I remember this so well. I thought, hey, you know what? I'll read an account of the resurrection. I was so proud of myself. And I did, and I thought, okay, that's kind of what I thought. And then I read another one. And you know what I noticed? And I didn't like it. That inside that Bible, there were some differences. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How come I have four accounts, and there are some things that are different? And I will tell you that the joy of my Easter went right out of my shoes. It went from my heart. You know that feeling where they say your heart sinks? And I was like, mm, what are the differences? And I didn't discuss it with anybody. I just went on and I, I kind of have mu I muddled through for a long time. I didn't like it, but I dealt with it. But that may be you. That may be you. You may be saying, I kind of like the whole concept, but you yeah, don't know about the whole thing. Differences can kill you. I found out something about those differences, and we've discussed them, and we're going to continue to discuss them, because as you go out to the workplace, and as our kids go off to college, and as our grandkids do things, they're going to be asked things, and if they don't have good answers, if they don't have people like me that can stand up here and tell you the difference, then they're in trouble. I guarantee you they're in trouble. Because there's somebody else on the outside that's going to question and question and question and question, and they're going to go, uh, nobody ever told me about that. Well, I'm going to try. Because there's a reason for that. And if you ask anybody, one of the leading detectives, he's been on um, uh, Dateline more than any other detective in the United States, he's a Christian. You know what he says about those? He says, I'm glad they're there. Because any time that there's a, 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 a murder or a crime, all the eyewitnesses have different stories. He said the last thing he wants them to do is to be in a room together where they can discuss it. Because then somebody who didn't see this now kind of says, well, maybe I saw that. And their story gets changed. And let me ask you this. If there is somebody out there who doubts, who doubts the resurrection story, 
Because there are differences, present it to them this way. If every single author of Scripture wrote it out word for word the same way, what would they say? Well, they all just got together and wrote it down. I don't believe it. See, you have to be open to the fact that these men wrote this down 2,000 years ago. And that it's a true story, even if there are some differences. And I can even explain those. I can even explain those. But I wanted to cover that because that was such a huge time in my life. I, I was a believer and I was there. And, and I, I read that and I'm like, oh my gosh. But today, I feel completely different. Because, to give you an example, in the book of Matthew, we'll discover them. Matthew wrote his book to the Jewish people, right? In, in Matthew's book, there's two Marys. Mary Magdalene and the mother of Jesus that go to the tomb. And an angel rolled the stone away. Okay, that's Matthew's account. And Mark, who was Peter's sidekick, Mark says that there are three women. He includes Salome. Now, does that mean that the Marys weren't there or that Salome wasn't there in Matthew's account? No, Matthew just didn't mention it. Okay, three women. Mary wondered how she rolled the stone away. Isn't that interesting that Mark covers that? Because don't you think that would have been a thought? Well, I mean, that, that stone's rolled there. How are we going to do that? Mark actually covers that. Mary wondered how she would do that. And there was one man in white, presumed to be an angel. Luke, who was a physician and, and, a, and a former uh, of the early church with Paul. Paul just mentions that there's women. He doesn't even give you a number. He just says women. And that there were two men in the tomb. And that Peter is there and he leaves very puzzled. Okay? So those are all the same with just a little difference. Doesn't make it untrue at all. It just, it's just like when we leave here, somebody will have a different story about what they saw as compared to somebody else. It's human nature. So, now there's only one gospel left, and that's the book of John. Now many people will say that the Bible can't be... Uh, factual because these were uneducated men who couldn't possibly do that. Well, there is biblical record of them be, uh, being involved with scribes and things that could write down and could do it. And I will guarantee you that many, many of the books that you and I choose to read that are located in that back there in Fellowship Hall right now were dictated to somebody who wrote them down and put them into a form. They were not written by the author. They were written by a scribe. So don't tell me that, that you have to be the author of that book. Because you can dictate it to somebody who can write it down, and it'll be word for word. Same deal that we live today. Same, same world. So, in John's account, Mary Magdalene was there. The stone was rolled away. So she ran back to tell Simon Peter and the other disciple, who we know is John. He doesn't name himself. And I think it's interesting, which I won't have, this will be next year's Easter message. I'm already ready. <laughs> We're going to talk about why she called him Simon Peter, but that's next year's message. You have to wait a year. I do expect y'all to be here. I'm going to write your name down. Okay? The other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, and she told those guys, they have taken him. They have taken him, and I don't know where they have put him. In other words, Mary looks in there and says, the body's gone. The body's gone, guys. What are we going to do? What will we do? So then, the only recorded, as far as I know, foot race in the Bible happens. If you read John's account, Peter starts out running for the tomb, but John runs faster. And he pretty much just says that. I think it was a little dig at Peter. I don't know how long, but he just basically says, I got ran. He took off running, but I got there first. And, but John was afraid to go inside. John wouldn't go inside. He looked inside and saw the garments. He saw the garments and he, he knew that the body was gone. But Peter goes inside. There was a folded cloth, which is another sermon. So now you can visualize, I think, the best that we can where we are on Easter Sunday morning, the very first one. So now we're going to cover it with our scripture. 
And we're going to start with verses 8 through 10. All right? This is right after all that stuff I just described to you. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first, which is John, remember I told you he he won the foot race, also went in. So now he's gone in, and he saw and believed. We'll come back to that. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus was rise from the dead. Do you remember? All along in our preparation, they didn't get it. They never got it. They were all following through the miracles. They didn't understand. I will rebuild the temple in three days. None of them got it. John is writing in his gospel, and he says, I, we finally understood that he said he must rise. And then they went home. I mean, what else are you going to do? Right? I mean, I, at first I thought that was kind of weird, but then I thought, well, what are they going to do? You know, kick up some lawn chairs and wait. I mean, they went home. And they all recorded that, that they went home at that point. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. This is the only gospel that records this, and that's why I want to talk about it today, because this is absolutely fascinating. Mary is, is there again. She is standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. So she's outside the tomb, and she looks back in the tomb. She saw two robed angels. Now remember, some of the accounts mention one. John mentions two. If you have two, don't you also have one? So what difference does it make if you have one or two? If you say there's two, then there's also one. Maybe you just see one. Here's, here's John's account. One sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where Jesus' body had been lying. So Mary was there. Here's the angel. Are the angels there? And they say to her, Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked you, asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied. She, she assumes that someone has stolen the body. And I don't know where they have put it. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Now, for those of you that know your scripture, a little later on, on the, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus walks with two of the followers. And they don't know who he is either until he sits down and breaks bread with them. How or why this happens, we don't know. But this isn't the only occurrence of somebody being with Jesus and she doesn't recognize him. And he says to her, dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked, who are you looking for? Now one thing, and it will be an entire sermon at some point, but I'll just cover briefly today. When God asks you a question... When he asks you a question, when he asks questions of scripture, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. He knows the answer. He's just wanting to know and stir up inside of you. What is your answer? Who are you looking for? Jesus wants her to know. She thought he was the gardener. That's the title this morning. Gardener. So she thought he was the gardener. So she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you put him, and I'll go get him. Just, just tell me. I mean, I'm a servant. I'm a servant. Just tell me because I want to get him back. That's all I really want. Mary, Jesus said. He called her by name. Mary, Jesus said. And she turned to him and cried out in moaning, which in Hebrew means teacher. Don't claim to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go to find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Isn't that interesting? He didn't just say, I'm going to my Father and my God. He said, I'm going to my Father and your God. Why put that detail in there? Why put that detail in there unless it was God who said it, and we'll never forget it. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. And then she gave them his message. There's your first Easter. In fact, there's the added part after the men had already blitzed the scene. As one account said, Peter went home discouraged and dismayed. Peter didn't get it. Mary didn't either, but Mary stuck around a little longer. Ladies, this resurrection is a tribute to you. Because at this point in the world, ladies had absolutely no say. But God actually makes them the heroes of the resurrection Sunday. He does. So, 
As I said earlier, did you catch the title in verse 15? She thought he was what? The gardener. The gardener. Now that was probably common and that was probably normal that there would be someone there to take care of, of these burial plots and things, I guess. But she thought he was the gardener. So I guess it was a simple mistake. But as I read this and as I studied this for today's message, I wondered if you and I, if we do the same. I mean, maybe we don't label Jesus the gardener. But do we have a spiritual influence in our lives that we attribute to someone else? Do we write things off in our lives as coincidence or whatever we choose because that puts it on the level of our understanding. You see, she just wanted to know where the body was so she could go get it. She didn't have a clue that that was Jesus saying this. And I know in my own life there have been times when my Lord stood there and I gave credit to somebody else. I gave credit to somebody else. Why? Because I couldn't understand God being there for me. But I could understand if it was something else. I may not have called him the gardener, but I might have called him something else. But what does he call her? He called her by name. And then she gets it. And instead of calling him the gardener in our lives, I wonder if sometimes we, we lose him in the hustle and bustle of our jobs. Because our jobs are the little G God. I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to the man in the mirror because that's very easy to do. I've lived it and I've seen it. When kids' activities become the God, the little G God, and we start calling Jesus the gardener, because we understand the gardener and we don't understand Jesus. Sometimes we even call our spouses God. Sometimes we call alcohol or drugs God, tobacco. We, we do. We call TV God. And I'm sure you get it by now. So I wonder if Jesus is standing right there and we are weeping. We are weeping as Mary did. We're weeping for ourselves the place that we are, our world, and we weep for each other because we don't recognize that he's right there. Because to me, that's what Easter morning is. Because without Easter morning, I don't know how much of a place Jesus takes in history. Very, very little at the end. Because he was just a Jewish teacher. A few people that followed, and there were others. What place does Jesus take in your life? And I believe that that's whenever the weeping switches. And he weeps for us. He weeps for us because we don't get it. That he came back to save us. And we still see a garden. Because in this story, there are two characters there's a gardener and there's a savior. When you leave here today, and when I leave here today, you're going to take one of those two guys with you. You're going to leave this morning and you're going to think about the gardener, whatever that is in your life. Or you're going to think about the Savior. That came back.
back for all of us. Why? Because the gardener made sense and the gardener was common. Do we cling to those things because they are common? And I added a note this morning, which I very rarely do, but I did because I thought it was important enough. It struck me for a reason. And that was when Mary said, Tell me where you have put him and I will go get him. See, that's that's me. <laughs> that's crazy, Todd. I do that. Just tell me what I'm supposed to do, and I'll do it. I'll do it. Just tell me. Jesus said, I'm here. You don't have to do anything. Weren't you listening? For me, he can search Jughead right there. He does it for you. For me, he can search that. Weren't you listening? Because being a Savior brings glory and grace. But it also brings an accountability. We have that too. As believers, we are accountable to be different. Do you remember what I said from that 1987 picture? I didn't go to church that day to hear an Easter message. I went to church that day to watch an Easter message. I wanted to watch an Easter message. And I see you sitting there in church. But what do I see you doing when you're not inside those walls? I see you standing and singing. But what do I see you doing anywhere else? And I know it's not about works. But faith manifests itself in works. You will have a different if you call him Savior. You have to. Those aren't my words, those are his. And if you want to know what they are, they're actually right here. I actually have them handy. In the 10th chapter of Matthew, verse 38, if you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of being mine. Those are his words, not mine. So see, this day we hear a lot about the cross. This week, we've heard a lot about the cross. We all have one as believers. And Jesus says, if you refuse to take it up, you're not worthy of being on. I love it and I don't like it all at the same time. That's accountability. What do we do with the time that we have given? And I have in my notes in my Bible that that is the first time that the cross is ever mentioned in the scriptures. When he said it in Matthew 10. So I'll close with this thought. Because of how powerful I think that it is. I didn't even have it, think I had time to include it. But if you read the scriptures, you will realize that the scripture doesn't record people being changed or led by theories. People aren't changed or led by theories. God always chooses people. He always chooses people to change and to lead and to make a difference. And in 1987, as an unbeliever, that's exactly what I was looking for. Because this world... This world will absolutely try to sell you a lot of things, a lot of theories, and a lot of things that happen to you and to me. But I'm telling you right now, guys, I see it every day, and I'm actually grateful for it, even though it's hard to swallow sometimes. I am grateful for the fact that I get to see people want the truth. People want something different. They, the world will leave you with an empty soul. The world and its theories will leave you with an empty soul. So it's his way. Will you and I step forward and be those that have chosen to be different? Not perfect, but different. You can give an excuse. And in my notes, I actually put you can give me an excuse, but you're not giving me an excuse. 
You can snow me over any day of the week. But you can't fool him. And if you believe in that, you believe he's your savior and not your gardener. Because your gardener, you don't care. Your savior, you can't deny. No more excuses. Take up your cross and follow him. Make your own rules and do it your own way. That guy in 87 had a patent on that. I was good at it. I was really good at it. I thought I was. That will lead to a very empty life. The Savior that stands beside you, a full life. A completely different life. His way. For those that choose to do it their own way, and I mean this, I will pray for you. Because I am completely sure that that kid back in 87 had plenty of people praying for him. And do you know how I know that? Because the day that I was baptized, well, and then I came forward in the church, I can even tell you who they were. I had people in that church that about pitching my neck off my head and hugging me and saying, I've been praying for this day. That's how. So if you have decisions that you need to make in your own life, you're absolutely willing to make those whenever you need to. But I guarantee you, you'll know it if you make it on Easter Sunday. We can pray. Our God and our Father, as we look back over the scriptures and through time, we see this glorious Easter Sunday, a day where we were all saved forever if we choose to follow a Savior. Father, the accounts of the life of Jesus are, are incredibly fascinating. And to see this account of John and Mary's encounter with Jesus that I'm sure that she shared with him after, I'm sure that it was too much for her to keep inside. And she shared. And it's changed lives forever that she admitted that she saw a gardener when she saw the Savior, when she had the Savior. May we see in our lives the Savior and not see the gardener as we go through this life together with you, as we live with you 